Hi, my name is Grace Ann Roberts, and I'm the line producer at Shakespeare Theatre Company. It's my pleasure to introduce this episode of Shakespeare Hour Live on Shakespeare and the novel. Now, those of you who were watching the live broadcast with us, you know we had a few technical difficulties at the top of the hour, and we really appreciate your patience as we got that all sorted out. But luckily, despite all of that, we were able to capture the whole conversation for you to enjoy now. First, I just want to offer a few words of thanks and introduce you to our panelists. Shakespeare Hour Live is a component of Shakespeare Everywhere, which is made possible by the visionary support of the Beach Street Foundation. Additional support is generously provided by Nan Beckley, and tonight's episode is sponsored by Frona Hall. Thank you all so much. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce these guests. We had a fantastic panel with us for this episode, and I can't wait for you to meet them. Uh, first is Dr. Brandy K. Adams. She's an undergraduate program manager at MIT, and as of August 2021, she will be an assistant professor of English at Arizona State University. Her research areas include the history of the book, the history of reading, and early modern English drama. Secondly, we have Alexandra Petri, Washington Post columnist, playwright, and author, whose most recent book of essays is titled Nothing is Wrong and Here is Why. And last but certainly not least, prolific author and essayist Jane Smiley, whose novel A Thousand Acres, which is of course a retelling of King Lear, won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 1992. And of course, uh, your favorite co-hosts, Simon Godwin, STC's artistic director, and Dr. Drew Lichtenberg, STC's resident dramaturg. You are in great hands with the five of them. Uh, so without further ado, enjoy the conversation. Hello, Simon. And one might say tonight, all the world is a page. Uh, right away without the a brilliant beginning for you, thank you, goodness. Uh, and I also want to extend as a current Petworth, Petworther, Petworthian uh, to Brandy, a, a hearty hello from the greatest neighborhood in our great Washington DC uh, city. Uh, so hello all, let's get literary. Our topic tonight is Shakespeare and the novel. And there's a number of uh, lenses through which one can approach this vast topic. Uh, the influence of novels or proto novels, if you will, on Shakespeare's plays and dramaturgy, uh, Shakespeare's plays as novels or as books, uh, and then Shakespeare's subsequent influence on novels, uh, whether that's in straightforward adaptations, in novels that are titled after Shakespeare, like Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, for example, or The Sound of the Fury by William Faulkner, Above My Shoulder. Um, but I wanted to start just with a slight, small, potted history of Shakespeare and the proto-novel. Um, many, many, the, in fact, the majority of Shakespeare's plays are themselves drawn from Renaissance prose or poetic narratives known as novellas in Boccaccio's The Decameron, uh, the Italian for tale. Um, Othello and Measure for Measure come from Giraldi Cinthio. Romeo and Juliet comes from a translation of a novella by Matteo Bandello. Uh, I could go on and on. There's links in Shakespeare's plays to Chaucer, such as Troilus and Cressida, uh, or The Two Noble Kinsmen, a collaboration with John Fletcher. There's adaptations uh, from Boccaccio. Uh, Cymbeline, I believe, takes a subplot from the Decameron. There are others. Uh, and of course, most famously, uh, there's the lost play by Shakespeare, Cardenio, which he wrote with his younger collaborator, John Fletcher. Uh, which is believed to be a, an adaptation of a subplot from Don Quixote by his great contemporary Miguel de Cervantes, uh, and Don Quixote being itself maybe one of the first modern novels in Western European literature. So at first glance, though Shakespeare himself never wrote a novel or something that we, that we consider a novel, that he wrote plays and poems and sonnets and long verse poems, uh, the links between Shakespeare and the novel go quite deep. Uh, and that's sort of what we're gonna start examining uh, tonight. Uh, this question of medium uh, and Shakespeare's relationship to this, to another medium, another literary medium. And uh, the, the sort of prompt that we shared with our panelists to respond to initially is this question of medium, of short form versus long form. Of course, plays, 
are written to be performed in one space and in real time uh, to be consumed all at once, whereas a novel is something that is long form, is something that you can pick up, put down, consume at your leisure. Uh, so that's it's one way of drawing a distinction, although maybe it's a distinction that doesn't hold or sustain. And I thought, Brandy, maybe we would start with you as the expert on the history of the book uh, to give us some schooling on how to think about these questions. Hey, thank you, Drew. Um, I would like to start by sort of arguing that um, without the printed book, uh, either in quarto form, which is a small um, book, uh, the pages are folded into fours and cut, um, and the place where some of the plays were printed, not all of them, um, and some in multiple editions uh, in anywhere between 15, 1590, and right before the first folio, which is the collection of all the plays in 1623, um, people could go to book shops in Paul's churchyard and look for plays by Shakespeare. Sometimes his name was on the quarto, sometimes it wasn't, um, and they could read the plays. So in addition to seeing them performed, um, whether at the Globe or at Blackf Blackfriars, um, people could pick up plays and put them down, um, pick them up multiple times, read them with friends, read them aloud. And the experience um, I, I think is just as important as being able to go to the theater. Um, in some cases, we believe that women readers who may not have gone to the theater would have been able to read these plays um, as they were you know, printed. Also, if you didn't live in London and you, and you didn't have the opportunity to get to the city, you could maybe live in York and read the printed plays, which I think is extremely important. Um, and while you can consume Shakespeare um, plays all at once, um, if you were standing at the Globe or lucky enough to be able to afford uh, a seat um, while you were eating and there were all these exciting things going on, um, the experience of sitting and reading um, is, is one that allows you to sort of think about things like sources and things that um, different different books or different materials that Shakespeare may have read um, that add to the place themselves. Um, and I do want to add that Shakespeare wasn't writing alone um, as a member of a theater company. There were always going to be people who are adding and subtracting dialogue. There are actors. There's just a huge community, much like the Shakespeare theater, where there's this constant conversation going on. And I, I like to think about theater and sort of book history as having this um, wonderful intersection, and there's lots of conversations that can be had between and among people who are interested in both. Thanks. Yeah, it's it's true, of course. There's this wonderful paradox that uh, th th that Shakespeare's plays were uh, orally performed, but it's thanks in part to the Gutenberg printing press and this technology that allows them to be uh, captured as as books, printed as books, uh, that we have that all these hundreds of years later. And in fact, that may be one reason for their, their central canonicity in literature is that they, they, just, they just are transmitted to us technologically. Uh, and there are various schools of thought, but I think it's, it's got to be true that reading Shakespeare's plays as books is at least as big a reason for their continued popularity and influence as them being performed uh, in the theater. Uh, I'm curious, Alexandra, before we went live, you were talking about some of the literary reception of Shakespeare over the centuries that you did some poking around in. Uh, could you sure. us a little bit? Well, I actually first wanted to just echo what Brandy said about the joy of sitting down, which I feel like that's a joy that I always experience um, and has remained a consistently excellent thing uh, in the course of the pandemic times. So the experience of sitting down and reading something versus having to stand, even the most enjoyable thing you're consuming while standing up is less enjoyable uh, compared to the pleasure of a chair. So I'm very into the pleasures of the chair. But it's funny too, because in like the 18th century, people were enjoying seeing sort of the melodramas so much on stage and like Shakespeare and so forth that actually like Charles Lamb and a bunch of romantic types were having a backlash and they were like, actually the real way to consume Shakespeare is it reading him on the page. You shouldn't be seeing him. You have to do the work with your mind. Anyone can do acting with their face, but really it's the mind work that's the key. And so they were trying to kind of gatekeep in this fun way. And they all like Coleridge and the gang became convinced that Hamlet was like the first novel ever written. And that of course Shakespeare was taking things from his sources, but only so that he could elaborate 
further on the human mind and just they really went all in on Hamlet as being the most interior book ever written to the point that in the 19th century uh, Dickens who was Mr. Supernovel I say trying to introduce Dickens to the crowd heard of Dickens no but so Dickens uh he actually turned around on it and was like you know these melodramas I feel like people are being too mean to them and in fact Hamlet is kind of ridiculous and I, I hope I ever come to love anything as much as Charles Dickens loved just clowning on Hamlet consistently like originally in the first draft of A Christmas Carol he had a whole paragraph talking about how Hamlet's intellect was weak that he removed because it just, I guess, you really needed to get into the plot. It's a short play or book, but he initially says, perhaps you think that Hamlet's intellects were strong. I doubt it. If you could have such a son tomorrow, depend on it, you would find him a poser. He would be a most impracticable fellow to deal with and however creditable he might be to his family, after his decease, he would prove a special encumbrance in his lifetime, trust me which, okay, Dickens, unload. So it was fun seeing how Shakespeare, both people were tried to convince themselves that he had been writing novels. And then when they started writing novels themselves, they would include little scenes of Shakespeare to try to show their take on him because he was such a well-known text because he had been printed and everybody was encountering him and seeing him on stage or reading him in some way. And so like you get in the picture of Dorian Gray, you get rendition after rendition of Shakespeare plays and Dorian falls in love with Sybil Vane. And just everybody wants to say something about Shakespeare because he's someone that so many people have been talking about and looking at for years. So in the course of adapting him, I think you also wind up seeing people trying to become part of the conversation, which he started. Right, and I think you're putting your finger on something uh, so so wide and so hard to trace, but so important, which is this question of influence, right? This 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 fact that Shakespeare is preserved for us in these books, and then he kind of just disseminates through culture, and you can spot him in this kind of magpie way here, there. Oh, he pops up in Dickens. Uh, Goethe loves him, you know, and and this kind of retroactive romanticization of the theatrical experience of seeing Shakespeare, encountering him first uh, on the page. Um, Jane, you of course are a novelist and you have transferred uh, Shakespeare to the page in A Thousand Acres, this, ex this extraordinary book. I'm curious uh, to, get a, to get a sense of your process on, on how you translated him from one medium uh, to another. Was it an well, intuitive thing? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm happy to talk about that, but I want to refer to what um, Alexandra was saying, because one of my favorite 19th century novels is um, He Knew He Was Right by Anthony Trollope. And that is littered with references to Othello. And um, the, one of the most interesting characters is um, basically the Iago-ish figure who's always interfering uh, with the, the uh, couple who are trying to be married. Um, as for myself, well, I, I was introduced to Shakespeare at quite a young age. I think we read our first Shakespeare play when I was in seventh grade. Um, and of course we read them, a lot of them over the course of, you know, all of high school, all of college, all of graduate school. And King Lear did not fascinate me. It, it annoyed me. We read it over and over. Um, and I was always annoyed that uh, Lear himself never shut up and that Goneril and Reagan never got to say what their point of view was, how they thought of things. And so that's how I got interested in that and, and in rewriting that. I was on their side. I thought they had something to say. Um, I lived in Iowa. I, I thought there was a big farming crisis at the time that had got, been going on for a while. I thought it was quite interesting to talk about those things. And I was in Northern Iowa where there was, um, there had been Northern Iowa, North Central Iowa had been a marsh. And uh, farmers came, immigrant farmers came from Norfolk and they were used to draining um, marshes and, and using them for farmland. And that's what they did. And one of the big crises was um, that they would, when they put, started putting pesticides on the landscape, 
um, it would get into the water system and therefore into the wells and therefore into the people who were doing the farming. So that just fascinated me. And um, I, picked up, I, I picked up the play, I read it five times in a row, even though I'd read it plenty of times in school. And I just tried to adhere to the play as much as I could. At one point, I think in about act four, I realized I diverged from the play and, and, and I had to go back and sort of rewrite and go back to it. Um, it was a fascinating puzzle. Um, I knew that um, Shakespeare had gotten the material from somewhere else. Um, now I know more a lot about, so I'm gonna put in a recommendation for this book by James Shapiro, Year of Lear, my absolute favorite Shakespeare book. Um, and I figured, well, if he did it, I did it. I could do it, you know, and we've read so many plays of all different kinds by Shakespeare that I sort of referred to him as Uncle Bill. But um, I have to say that by the time I finished A Thousand Acres, I realized, yeah, he was pretty much different from me. And that was okay, I forgave him for that. But it was fun to write. Um, it was like a puzzle and it fascinated me and I just enjoyed it a lot. Uh, former- Let me say one thing uh, though. I had already written The Greenlanders, which was a retelling or a, 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 a story in the form of an Icelandic saga um, that took, takes place in Greenland uh, in the mid 15th century. And so I was used to writing um, historical novels, but there was something, and yes, everybody dies off in the Greenlanders. That just, that's just what happens. But there was something more disturbing and in some ways more sadder I, in some ways sadder about a thousand acres than there was about the Greenlanders. And I still don't quite know what that was. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, in, in some ways, the, the lack of deaths or the lack of the kind of tragic resolution that you would expect uh, is more chilling in a thousand acres than the kind of pro forma uh, genre ending. Uh, although I should say, Jane, you, you say you're so different from Uncle Bill, but he himself adapted Nordic sagas and killed everyone at the end in he Hamlet. Did, yeah. He did, yep. Um, but uh, I, I had no idea, I have no idea what kind of access he had to saga literature. And I would love to know that. I mean, he, clearly he had access to a lot of different things and they were sort of floating around um, and so I, I would love to know that, what kind of access he had. Well, I, maybe, we can, maybe we can get into that later in the show. Okay. Uh, I'm, curious, I'm curious, Brandy, maybe for your response, uh, hearing from a, a practicing novelist about this, uh, this, this process of adaptation. Uh, does, it, does it resonate with your research interests or, um, yeah, Simon. And I, can I also add on your on your list, Brandy, just inspired by what Jane was saying, um, I, I'd like to wonder whether you can unpack a little bit about Shakespeare's library. Like, was he a man who had books around him? Do you think, oh, of course, we'll never know, but do you think he, he was reaching for those? Or where was he going to read his books? And a little bit also, Brandy, sorry, to, uh, about, about literacy and how much reading would have been commonplace and how much it was more democratic project the theatre because you just wouldn't need to be able to read. And, 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 and yes, Brandy. Um, those are a lot of questions, <laughs> so I will, I will do the best that I can. Um, I'll start off um, with sort of responding to, um, to Jane uh, as a novelist, it, it absolutely resonates. So there's a whole field of study um, in, in Shakespeare studies and in early modern studies where people work on adaptations um, and the adaptations can run from novels to paintings, to graphic novels, to films. And one of the researchers in, uh, who's written a book 
uh, called theories of adaptation is Linda Hutchinson. And she says that adaptations repeat without copying, they embed difference in similarity, and they're at once the self and the other. And I would very much argue that even though, um, Jane, you said that you were sort of going through the play piece by piece, you still made Lear your own. And, and it's, it's, a, it's very much a reflection of you and your reading of Lear. And every single book that claims to sort of be an adaptation or an appropriation of Shakespeare or use different um, characters or a line or something that, that sort of excites the author. Um, I, I still think that there's something that's very much centered in the author, him or herself. Um, and, and that's um, wonderful. And I, and I also sort of think about uh, Toni Morrison's Beloved. I know that a lot of people don't think about that as being a particularly Shakespearean play, but I actually think of it as an, a, an adaptation or an appropriation of Hamlet. Um, it's a, it's a, a, a ghost story in the same way that, that Hamlet's a ghost story. And um, Toni Morrison actually wanted to be an early modernist. She wanted to be um, a professor of Shakespeare or Renaissance drama, and it just didn't work out that way. And so you will see these sort of traces of, of Shakespeare in, in her work. Um, and so I, I think that as she was sort of writing Beloved, and she did do um, a play called Desdemona, which was an adaptation of Othello, but just like Toni Morrison, Jane is retelling the story in a way that resonates with her, resonates with oh, so many readers, obviously, um, as it was a wonderful prize winner. And um, so many of my friends were so excited, Jane, when, when they heard that that I was going to be able to speak with you. So you have fans everywhere. Um, you. We really appreciate uh, the work that you've done. Um, and in terms of literacy, it's really hard to tell if people were literate uh, during the time because people could read but not write, which I know that's hard to imagine that you could read something, but when you signed your name on a contract, you would simply like put an X. Um, so literacy rates are a little bit tough um, to, to trace, um, and especially among uh, women um, at the time or other sort of ethnic minorities who are living in London, there's a lot of stuff we just don't know. And as for Shakespeare's books, that's another one that's really difficult um, to know because we don't have collections of his books like Ben Johnson. We know that there's a collection of books at Cambridge that he signed his name in, either he borrowed or he bought. Um, he spent a lot of time near the inns of court, so maybe he was, you know, borrowing um, books from attorneys. Shakespeare's a little bit um, more difficult to sort of um, to, to track down. And so people do imagine that through the sources that he encountered, it, um, whether they were in translation or they were in Latin or Greek, um, and that whole sort of statement of John, Ben Johnson saying Shakespeare knew sort of a little bit of Latin and less Greek, that's also something that's um, a bit of hyperbole. Um, if, if you're a fan of Johnson, you know that's sort of his, his <laughs> modus operandi. And uh, as an elementary school student, you would learn um, these, uh, these classical languages. And so it's easy to imagine that, that Shakespeare did have the opportunity to read this material. And also, um, in Paul's churchyard in the center of London, there were loads of book stalls, and there's actually uh, poems about people borrowing books or reading books at the stalls and not buying and annoying the booksellers. Um, and there were people who would go and sort of read out loud. So for people who maybe didn't read or couldn't read as well, you could go and listen um, to other people reading. So literacy is a tough one, but I actually think more people read than perhaps we imagine, because you have ballads, you have all kinds of sort of ephemera that we don't necessarily have. But if you're lucky enough to visit the Folger Shakespeare Library, which is right down the street, um, you can sort of check out, um, at least in the museum part, um, and a lot of times Shakespeare theater actors will go and do some um, uh, research, which is always exciting, and and you can learn about um, all of these things. And there's a, a book, I believe it's by Robert Maiola, that talks about Shakespeare's books, um, and he does a wonderful job of trying to extrapolate all of this information. I think I answered all of your questions. Wow, I think you did extremely well, Brandy. That's I, I've been making notes. This is absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, 
uh, Drew. Yeah, it's so great to hear you t uh, mention Toni Morrison, uh, especially Desdemona, which we actually did a reading of at the at the Shakespeare Theatre Company a few years back. And just like Jane's adaptation, A Thousand Acres, what's so striking about Desdemona is the the reversal in who the narrator or who the the protagonist is. Uh, uh, not only is Desdemona sort of the, the pivotal character, but also this this figure who's referred to in Othello, but but never seen of her of her nurse, of her of her African nurse. And, and it seems like what's so fascinating and haunting Jane about A Thousand Acres is making Goneril the, or the Goneril figure, Ginny Cook, your 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 narrator figure. Uh, and it just completely transforms the way you see the play. It makes Lear into this almost monstrous figure. Uh, and you think, my God, how could he ever be the protagonist of his own play? You, you had uh, raised your hand, I wonder. Uh, if, yeah, you have a thought. Well, I wanted to say something since we're talking about Desdemona and the Folger Library. Um, we were, some of us were asked to write some more adaptions um, a couple of years ago. And I am a really big fan of Marguerite of Navarre who wrote the Heptameron. And so the one I wrote was called Marguerite of Navarre gives Desdemona some advice. And it was a series of letters packing, passing back and forth where the, the two, these two older women are trying to help her and they're too late. And it's just a short story, but I, I adored writing it. So I think Othello is a very interesting play. Mm. And, um, that that was the only, that was the reason I was raising my hand. Mm. Um, well, I I wonder what you, whether I can I I can pivot back to Alexandra for a second because I, I think something that Brandy and Jane have both alluded to is is about for me a question about what is it about the particular Shakespearean narratives that maybe make them so amenable to adaptation. I'm just thinking how, um, so the, as a director, one loves directing Shakespeare because in a way he feels both complete yet incomplete, like there's room somehow for one to come along and reset the play in a different period to tilt it towards one interpretation or another. And I suppose in the versions we're talking about tonight of actually going further and retelling, re, re narratorizing as it were, a play, uh, it's, it's born tremendous fruit. Do you have a feeling, Alexandra, about, about, about that, that, that unique Shakespearean quality, if you like, that we're chasing tonight? Oh, sure. No, I think the thing that's always struck me about Shakespeare is how populous all of the plays are, because there's always more there than there needs to be. Because there, I think when you're creating a world, some of the things you do from your own sort of personal interests and psychological eccentricities and some things you do for story movement and other things you put there out of whimsy. And he's got a lot of whimsy and these sort of things that don't really need to be there for movement. So I actually think when you're adapting him, it presents a challenge, not just all the unfinished elements of the story that you want to get in and sort of move your mind around in and wrap your head around and finish telling, but also all the things that he included, you think, well, does there really need to be a funny guy who's like digging and making jokes? Like, is that gravy? Can I get rid of that? And it's fascinating how much is in there. Cause if you think of other authors, uh, even contemporaries from Shakespeare's time, like Marlowe, like, I mean, Faustus is constantly getting adapted all the time. Everybody, all they ever do is adapt Faustus, but it's a very claustrophobic play in a strange way. There's like two people there and they travel around, but there's not, the sort of profusion of life that you usually see in a Shakespeare play, where even in something as self-contained as The Tempest, you've got all kinds of people, you've got all this backstory, there's like a whole, I mean, you're stuck on an island the entire time, and yet there's this whole, with Sycorax and the whole sort of, here's, we haven't dealt with Caliban, just the amount of story that's implied by the story he tells is always just enormous and iceberg-like. So I do think everyone wants to go and visit those icebergs. So he's perpetually appealing in that regard. And I, I also think there's nothing more sort of human in the storytelling sense than the desire to just keep retelling the same stories because you saw something there and you want to see if somebody else saw it there. I mean, going back to the Iliad, that's a retelling of a myth that just is like, what if we only told the part where Achilles is mad? And so I just think Shakespeare himself was doing it and now it's neat to see other people getting in on the fun. Um, I guess, I'm uh, oh, sorry, Tree. No, and, and just uh, going back to Hamlet, because you mentioned the Gravedigger, uh, also Osric just shows up in Act Five and starts making jokes. Uh, but Jane was mentioning Hamlet earlier, right? Wanting to know where this comes from. 
And it's so fascinating, this, this notion of telling and retelling and retelling, because there's the Saxo grammatics, there's the 13th century Nordic tale, uh, but then there's also maybe Thomas Kidd's The Spanish Tragedy, which is of course like one of the, one of the famous revenge tragedies. And then there's this theory that there's this lost original Hamlet, Ur Hamlet, right? Before Shakespeare wrote his Hamlet. And then there's multiple quartos and the folio of Hamlet, as I'm sure you would point out, Brandy. So this question of the, the inspiration for Hamlet, right, where it comes from is almost impossible to answer. It's this story that keeps on unraveling and then unraveling itself back up and then unraveling again, this story that we keep on being drawn to over and over again. Um, absolutely, um, and I think that um, this largesse that Alexandra was talking about, the expansiveness of Shakespeare's vision uh, is a very inspiring, uh, and for me, it relates to the mythical quality as well. There are just these archetypes, aren't there, pouring out of him, which is so exciting to to appropriate, as it were, and, and retell. Now, in a minute, we're going to hear a little bit from from Jane's wonderful uh, novel, if we may, A Curse of Grace Anne. Um, let me just, um, before that, give you a little update on uh, the three uh, episodes coming up uh, during the month of March, which you can see now, I think, on your screen. Uh, future guests include uh, Whitney White, Sir Jonathan Bate, Julie Tamel, and others. And if you're not yet signed up, please visit us online to learn more and register. We hope that you will join us. Also streaming now, a little uh, commercial break, is our, uh, is our production of um, All the Devils Are Here, as Tony Patrick Page, our New York Times critic's pick. The show is given five stars by the New York Stage Review and has been called Enchanting, Perfection, a Tour de Force, and even Incredible. If you haven't seen it yet, get your tickets now. Uh, so, Grace, and you, we also, of course, might have some thoughts and comments and ideas from the audience. And uh, so over to you for some audience thoughts and questions. And also, if you're ready to, a little extract, uh, if we may, from uh, A Thousand Acres. Grace, Sure, you. of course. Before we, we get to A Thousand Acres, there are lots of thoughts with people sort of asking about specific titles or adaptations that they know of from their own library titles they admire. And I just, I would love to hear from the panel if you have a favorite, maybe to talk about specific titles, ones that come to mind that you think are particularly um, effective or interesting or ones that you just personally enjoy. Um, I think that I would love to hear that from our three guests. So maybe if one of you has one off the top yeah, of your head. Do you want to curate us through it? Everyone just talking, I mean, obviously we're talking about Beloved, which is great, and, and indeed A Thousand Acres, which we're about to hear from Grace and shortly, but yes, Julie, oh yes, great, Brandy has one, yes. Um, actually, I have three, if that's okay. Um, there's a, a book called Season of Migration to the North uh, by Tayeb uh, Saleh, which is um, a, it's a little bit of an older book, but it's a retelling of, of Othello. And there's a lot of exciting academic being, uh, work that has been done on it, and that's currently being being done. Um, there's a wonderful essay, an older essay by Jyotsna Singh, and then there's some really fantastic work being done right now by Umbarine Dadaboy. Um, there's another um, adaptation of the fellow, um, and I would say maybe it's more of an appropriation. It's called Crescent by Diana Abu Jaber. It is a wonderful, wonderful tale. Um, and I think one of the smartest um, appropriations I've read in the last two years. Um, and it has these really wonderful moments where you can see how Shakespeare sort of affects global discourse, um, both um, the book takes place on the West Coast, but also sort of how it spreads to uh, the Middle East. Um, and I thought that was fantastic. And then there's also a book by a local author, M.L. Rio, who is a PhD student at the University of Maryland. And she wrote, If We, we Were Villains, and um, it's this wonderful play about a theater company, a murder, and uh, how Shakespeare is sort of uh, interwoven into, into that book. I think it's wonderful. And I can't believe she wrote this before embarking on, on her PhD. And I just, I, I'm a very big fan. Brandy, that, that, that's absolutely thrilling for me as an artist director of the Shakespeare Theatre Company, uh, keen as I am always to find new versions of Shakespeare and interesting telling. So I, I, I think Drew and I uh, have taken uh, copious notes. Thank you, Brandy. Those are super inspiring. Um, Alexandra, is some favourites of yours? Sure. Well, I'm a big fan of, I, I like a good book that has just Shakespeare in the title. And then you see, well, is this play going to, this book going to be actually a Shakespeare adaptation or not? Like I read Cakes and Ale thinking they were gonna be 
cakes or ale in it. And I have to say, I'm not sure it's an adaptation of Twelfth Night ultimately, but I'm willing to hear people out on it. But one of my favorites actually is sort of a weird one called Her Private's We by Frederick Manning, which Ernest Hemingway said was his favorite novel ever written about World War One. And it's basically like a World War One just memoir novel type thing. But it actually is very Hamlet-y in the sense that Hamlet is a play about somebody who's trapped inside a story and doesn't want to be, and is made sort of keenly aware of his own mortality. And you know, you're the you're the moth that's flown in, and you're not sure you're going to make it back out the door again. And that's her private squeeze. So, and it originally had the title "The Middle Parts of Fortune" because they went through that phase where they're like, "Her private squeeze is much too racy," but let's just move one line up, and we're sure that'll be fine. So, I would also recommend that one. Sort of a a downer, of course, because World War One, but a, a a classic. Great, thank you, Alexandra. Uh, great, and uh, yeah, J Jane, do you have any other adaptations that perhaps were inspiring for you for, for you before you came to write the book, or indeed after? I didn't uh, actually know any before, other than, of course, West Side Story, which we all knew, and um, it it the music was so great, and every and the you know, everything about it was so interesting and such an interesting take on Romeo and Juliet. Um, I'm quite fond of Vinegar Girl by Ann Tyler, um, just because I think uh, The Taming of the Shrew is one of Shakespeare's most problematic plays, at least from the point of view of women. And so it, I thought it was quite interesting and brave of her to, to update that one and see what she could come up with. And we have a lot of viewers or several viewers mentioning the Hogarth series in particular, which you know has uh, such authors as Howard Jacobson. Someone mentioned uh, Gillian Flynn is slated to adapt Hamlet, which we've discussed so much tonight. So a lot of interest in Hogarth too. So I'm glad you mentioned Vinegar Girl, Vinegar Girl too, Jane. Um, I would be happy to read an excerpt of A Thousand Acres, Jane, if you if you don't mind. Um, I, I thought I would just go in cold and then maybe we can talk talk about it after, maybe if anyone can pick out the, the King Lear equivalent in the moment I chose. How does that sound? Great, okay, here we go. This is from A Thousand Acres, of course, by Jane Smiley. The only thing Harold said later was that one of the outside knives looked clogged. What he would have done then was to put, pull the rope that shut the valve on the top of the tank. Maybe he was in a hurry because then he got down off the tractor and went around to the malfunctioning knife where it bit a few inches into the soil. No one knows why he jiggled the hose. Possibly he only touched it while bending down, brushed against it with his hand or his sleeve. At any rate, the hose jerked off the knife and with the last puff of pressure remaining in the line, sprayed him in the face. He wasn't wearing goggles. Anhydrous ammonia isn't drawn to the eyes because of their moisture, the way people sometimes say it is. It only feels that way because the moisture in the eyes reacts with the fumes and creates a powerful alkali. In spite of the pain, Harold staggered to the water tank on top of the ammonia tank, knowing that his only hope was to flush his eyes and neutralize the ammonia the water tank was empty. At this point, Harold was overcome and he simply keeled over in the field. It was Dolly on her way to work at Casey's in Cabot who saw him. He was kneeling among the rows of corn, rocking back and forth with his hands over his face. There wasn't any water anywhere out there. So, <laughs> Simon, I don't know if you have any thoughts. Well, no, please, yes, I'm beautifully read, and congratulations, Jane. It's incredibly vivid, isn't it? Uh, and uh, well, uh, Jane, may, may, maybe maybe you should help us identify as well. I'm sure the viewers will have begun to find the correlation. But but thank you, Grace Anne and Jane. Well, I had to come up with some way for Harold to become blind, and it had to be. Um, had, it had to have something to do with farming and it had to be plausible. And that's basically what you want to do anytime you're writing a book. Um, you, you have to find ways to get to the end that are plausible. Um, I studied about the chemicals. I asked various experts about what might happen if this, this happened and that happened. And so that episode I came up with as a plausible way for 
Harold to become blind. I also want to uh, say that your solutions for the storm, your solution for the, the mad scene, truly uh, inventive and kind of unforgettable once, once you read them. They really stick in the mind or the mind's eye. Um, and, but uh, I also wanted to ask you, Jane, while you're with us about some of the significant differences or, or why you felt the need to make some differences. I don't know if we should get into spoiler territory here about a thousand acres, but you mentioned the kind of environmental uh, uh, concern, right? This, this theme of the poisoning of the land, the poisoning of well water over many years, which becomes this kind of archetypal family curse in the novel. There's also the fascinating detail that um, the, Cordelia, the Cordelia figure and the Edmund figure are both what we would now call in Washington, coastal liberal elites. Uh, Cordelia is this, I think she's a lawyer who flies to New York and reads the Atlantic and the New Yorker and brings issues home for her father, Larry to read. And Edmund is a, a Vietnam refugee who went to Vancouver and became very enthusiastic about organic farming and using green manure and, and uh, slaughtering pigs in ethical ways. Uh, if, you were, if you were doing a theatrical adaptation of it now, uh, I feel like reviewers would call it a red state, blue state allegory uh, that you're creating in, in this novel. Uh, so you, you find ways of, as, as Brandy was putting it, being, uh, bringing yourself to the work of, of reflecting Jane Smiley in the work. It's very much Jane Smiley's novel, even though there are all these ingenious solutions that you found for following almost, almost uh, in the same sequential order, all the events that are in Shakespeare's play. That's not a question. This is an observation more. Um, but yeah, I wonder, I wonder if, uh, if you have thoughts about the need to come up with differences or put a spin on things. And I'm not even mentioning the big one, which once you get to it halfway through the book is a total shocker. Well, the, the one that's, that I had to think about the most was, okay, King Lear it ends with a war. And I didn't think that was a likely prospect in Iowa in the 1980s. And so I decided it was a, it, they would come up with a legal battle. And so I had to find out about law, various laws, and I had to find out what they could do with regard to that. Um, but the other things, they just sort of came naturally. I had to make it work and um, I did the best I could. Well, this is, I, this is something we've talked about quite a lot on the Shakespeare Hour is, um, the timelessness of Shakespeare versus the need for contemporary artists in the theater or in film or in the novel to find new ways of making his plays relevant, of wrestling with his plays. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, Simon. Well, I just wanted to kind of return to, to some of the discussion that we've also talked about tonight because um, uh, perennially on the program, the question arises, is Shakespeare dated? In terms of should and in a way is our future with Shakespeare or what do we do about the flaws in Shakespeare? So we spoke. Jane spoke about the Taming of the Shrew, which we talked talk about last week, and the really difficult politics in that play. And I wonder whether we I might hear from and uh, maybe just starting with Brandy about how much do we think the job of the contemporary adapter is to rescue Shakespeare and, and and even in some level replace him, or do we feel like what matters is always the dialogue between the source material? And the new version. I don't know whether Brandy, you have a thought on the kind of the politics, if you like, on, of adaptation. Um, I, I I think that one of the things that's uh, terrific about um, Shakespeare studies, particularly right now, is how diverse it's become. There are so many different people who are doing work on um, gender, on race, on disability. Um, on uh, sexuality. Um, and I think that it's not so much a question of, of, of rescuing Shakespeare. I think it's a question of allowing these really important conversations to take place and have people read the plays using the lenses that they are extremely comfortable with. And um, thanks to, I think, I, I hope, um, 
I'm, I'm really lucky to have a lot of friends who are theater practitioners um, and we get to have these conversations about um, how things might have happened historically, how people might want to adapt um, and adopt these plays in, in, in a bunch of different ways. And um, I think that the field only becomes richer because we have so many people who are interested and in and engaged with with the text. Um, I, I'm, I'm certainly, people who know me well, um, Shakespeare is actually on the periphery of, of the work that I do. I tend to look at non-Shakespearean uh, playwrights. Um, I also think they're just ready to be adapted. Somebody please write adaptations of plays by Philip Massinger or by um, Fletcher or by, um, kid or by anybody. Um, and, and there has been some really exciting work um, done in Marlowe studies for sure. And, and I think that the more we realize that Shakespeare was one of many uh, playwrights who are writing in the period, including there were a few women as well. Um, uh, and, and you want to be able to, to have people understand that there's just a, an amazing amount of work out there that we can all read and learn from. Um, so no, I don't want to rescue him. I also want people to fight with Shakespeare. You don't have to love Shakespeare in order to read it, or you can love it and critique it. I think sometimes people feel like if you critique something, then it doesn't mean that you love it. I think that it means that you're deeply engaged and you absolutely love it. Um, so I don't want him to be rescued. Um, I also don't want him to be center um, of everything. Um, I think you probably noticed um, a lot of, I love reading Alexandra's um, uh, posts um, in the Washington Post uh, because she can sort of take a situation, make it really funny, um, make us think about sort of all of the inconsistencies that happen, that happens in Shakespeare plays. And I think we need to um, just revel in it and, and just enjoy the work that, that's out there. That's so inspiring. Thank you, Brandy. It's so inspiring. And it, for me, it relates to that wonderful image that you've given us of about St. Paul's Churchyard and people picking up those books, uh, those editions, and or hearing them read aloud and just sort of all imagining them differently somehow. Uh, and that's sort of continuing and, and, and encouraging that. Um, Alexandra, do you, do you want to weigh, on, weigh in and respond to that in some way, that, that this ongoing debate about uh, he, different kinds of rescue or healing or dialogues, Alexandra? Absolutely. I think what, what Brandy said was great in terms of Shakespeare can be a way in and also a way out of himself. So he can lead you through himself to other things. Like it doesn't, he, you don't have to stop in Shakespeare and say, this is it, this is all we have. Instead, like the conversations around him and the text that he leads you to and his other contemporaries and just the world that he opens up, it's not a stopping point, it's sort of a starting point. And I do think it's one of those things where, again, as Brandy was saying, I'm just gonna repeat your answer with great enthusiasm, but uh, to say, I, I can't stand this, it infuriates me. That doesn't mean that you actually hate it sometimes. It means that you're just really, that's how often I describe a character that, towards whom I feel deep affection. It's like, I can't believe this person did this. Like it feels real in a way. And I think to the extent that Shakespeare is something that a lot of people have been sort of had their heads shoved into over a desk in like the least congenial setting possible. But that what that has made him in, is into sort of a common language that a lot of people, whether they wanted to or not, they're like, well, I have at some point read Romeo and Juliet, and I'm mad about everyone, or I was dragged through Macbeth so that at least I got to correct somebody on Twitter who said that Sound and Fury was by Faulkner, as opposed to, no, no, you know, Faulkner just put the these in the, in the title, so Hamlet is Shakespeare, the Hamlet is Faulkner, they're very, very different, um, but so I think to the extent that it's something that everyone is able to talk about and come to, and I also think of the notion of sort of fan fiction, which is something where people, you see a text and you think this is incomplete. And I wanna sort of put something of myself into this. And I think Shakespeare is so engaging, partially because he's so rich, but also because he is demonstrably incomplete. And there's perspectives missing and there's stories missing and there's things that he just didn't know. And there's things that he ran roughshod over despite how much he knew about the human spirit. And I, so I think it's, great that we're talking about that and continuing the conversation yeah br brilliant but well, well but before i before i before i sort of um invite maybe drew and jane to to, to reflect on this question too i didn't want to deprive our audience uh, drew and grace and if there are any thoughts or, or questions from our audience that we want us to kind of address in the last few minutes well i think just to just to riff off of alexandra's reference to fan fiction we haven't even discussed shakespeare and science fiction shakespeare and fantasy shakespeare and young adult 
we haven't discussed probably the numerous Klingon language adaptations of Shakespeare. Um, and then there's also the kind of, I think which, what you referred to Alexandra is the Hamlet-y uh, books, right? Like I have one over my shoulder here in Infinite Jest, which is taking its title from Hamlet, but it's also an attempt at kind of writing a Generation X version of Hamlet, if Hamlet were alive in the 90s and watching a lot of bad cable television <laughs> and doing drugs and drinking, right? So there's this, there's the analogical uh, literary inspiration that, that writers have taken from Shakespeare as well. Uh, and, and I think that's a form of wrestling with Shakespeare. It's a form of rewriting Shakespeare. It's a form of uh, 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 disagreeing with Shakespeare in a creative and inventive and innovative way. Um, yes, and, and I think that sense of affectionate wrestling is is so spot on. Um, Jane, uh, do you, do you, did you feel you, you were rescuing Shakespeare or, or, or were you in a kind of, yes, an affectionate embrace with him when you read that King Lear five times as you so vividly described? I wouldn't call it, well, not with Lear. That wasn't my affectionate embrace. I liked other plays that we read better, Twelfth Night or uh, Hamlet. Um, so no, it wasn't an affectionate wrestling, but it was a fascinated wrestling. One of the things that we know about authors is that they come and go. Um, one of the things that we know about Shakespeare that Dickens commented on was that in the early 19th century, he, was, he had been lost a little bit until the theater sort of took off and one of Dickens' friends brought him back. And then Dickens himself was kind of lost after he died and um, he sort of came back in the 1930s. So that's just what happens. Authors do that. Um, but I love the fact with regard to Shakespeare that so many authors want to engage, that so many authors want to be inspired, that so many authors are willing to make their way through the language and pay attention to what he's writing about. And they're willing to argue as well as to you know, give him their affection and respect. I think that's a great thing. Well, thank you so much. And I, I can't help feeling that through our conversation tonight, his ghost has been, been with us. And I'm sure from a distant place, um, he's still uh, very much enjoying being wrestled with and challenged and questioned. Um, tonight, uh, one of my four-year-old twins, I've been reading the Greek myths, came up to me and said, Daddy, does Hades still exist? And uh, I, I, I kind of try to start grappling with maybe the underworld and, and, and all these questions and realizing, well, that, that, that these questions uh, don't need to be answered, do they? They just need to be lived. And these myths do continue to nourish us in, in amazing and unexpected ways. Thank you so much uh, to Brandy, to Alexandra, to Jane and to Grace and, and to Drew. And next week, we return to the canon to talk about Titus Andronicus. Uh, tune in. Uh, joining us will be Tony Award winning director Julie Taymor, uh, Dr. Martine Key Green Rogers. Uh, you may both remember uh, Julie and Martine from their appearances on Shakespeare Hour Live in the last fall. Uh, we're thrilled to have them back to help us dissect no pun intended, Shakespeare's bloodiest play. Um, until then, stay well, stay safe, everybody. And thank you so much for being part of the show tonight. And thank you again to my wonderful panelists. Good night.